Hello everyone and welcome. I'm the Retro Repair Guy. For those of you who didn't see my first episode, I focus on restoring vintage electronic equipment of all kind. Today we look at the 1977 Hitachi HA330 amplifier. This particular unit is of sentimental value to me because it was owned by my uncle whom I was very close to. Many times in the 70s and 80s, I would go over to my aunt and uncle's and I would spend the weekend with my uncle fixing electronic equipment and making mixtapes and play records on this very same amp. But it's now 44 years old, and it's a bit of a long story, but it was sitting for almost 20 years since he passed away in a mold-infested environment and survived the major 12-hour water leak from pipes bursting. So I won't be plugging it in to test what kind of shape it's in, and needless to say that with 44-year-old capacitors, there's no doubt I'll be recapping this entire unit. There's not much information available online for this model, however, Hitachi is a prevalent household name when it comes to electronics, and of course, like many quality electronic manufacturers of the 80s, it was, and still is, headquartered in Japan. I was able to get a hold of the service manual which states that it has the following features. High output power pure complementary OCL type. Now, OCL stands for Output Capacitorless Amplifier Design. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have any capacitors, it just means that there is no output coupling capacitor. One of its advantages is that it allows the unit to deliver high power outputs at low audio frequency. OCL amplifiers waste a lot more power because of their design, but the results speak for themselves, as you hear much louder and clearer sounds emanating from the speakers. Today, amplifiers such as these are quite expensive and fetch several thousands of dollars. It also has large power level meters, Protective circuitry for safety, not sure exactly what they mean by that, but to tell you the truth, I quickly read through it and from my understanding it limits the current going to the transistors to protect it from failing. A low filter that reduces hum and rumbling in the ultra low frequencies without impairing the sound quality. It also accommodates for two sets of tape deck inputs and outputs and speaker outputs, so you can plug in four speakers, the A's and the B's. I begin by opening up the unit to see what kind of capacitors are in there so I can order the right ones as well as to see if there's any physical damage to the unit. These two large capacitors are at the heart of it all. There's one for each channel. I'm going to undo one capacitor to make sure I order the right part. At first glance the rest of the board doesn't look like there's any damage so I'm just going to take note of all the capacitors and I am going to order them and replace them. It's the only thing I can do anyways before I test the unit. One thing I really appreciate about these old units is the fact that you can remove the bottom plate and have access to everything. You don't need to remove all the boards and all the connectors. I'm going to speed this up not to bore you. Now it's very important, I want to mention something about these capacitors. You, if ever you pull one out of a unit and you see there are multiple legs coming out, it's very important that you read the side. Some of these will have two or three capacitors inside of one, all right? And it will say the values on the side. In this case, if you look, and I, I will give you a close-up of this in a minute, um, A blank, B blank, C 50 volts, 10,000 microfarads, and D blank. All right, so in this case, there really is only one and only two of these are being used. The rest is being used for support. So just a call, word of caution when you're looking at these and when you're ordering them. So this can effectively be replaced with a uh, only two leg capacitor of the same value, of course. All right, so here's a close up of the capacitor. A, B, C, D, as you can see on the side, A, B, and D being blank. And if we look at the legs underneath, the black represents a negative, and the opposite one here represents the positive.
Now I'm recapping the entire unit. So I'm starting with the upper board and I'm removing every single capacitor. If you've never done this before, I suggest that you do one at a time. I'm comfortable doing three or four at a time. Uh, you can always double check with the spec, which is what I'm doing anyways, because I don't like old units. I always think somebody's been in there playing, uh, maybe changed something for the wrong value. So always better to check anyways. As always, soldering the new one is pretty straightforward. Put it in, spread the legs a bit, make sure it's holding in place, and just solder. So another thing I'm doing is I'm going through the whole board and looking for cracked, broken, or cold solder joints, um, especially around the switches and stuff like that. You know, um, there's a lot of heat in there and pushing the on off buttons or anything like that that's moving. I don't trust it, so I'm redoing. And to tell you the truth, in the end, I ended up doing 95% of all of it. So here's the completed board. I uh, redone all the soldering. I changed all the capacitors. And I, of course, cleaned it all up. These are all the new capacitors. They're all Nichicon audio capacitors. While I wait for the other capacitors I ordered to come in, and my wife is away, there's no better time for me to wash the 44-year-old grease and mold off the casing. Dishwashing liquid is mild and safe to use and won't leave any residue. For tough stains and grease, you can do a second washing with baking soda. But I do recommend washing off what you can first with dishwashing liquid and rinsing it off thoroughly. And just don't tell my wife I used one of her new brushes. When you're finished with that, dry it off and use some Windex. I'm using some multi-purpose Windex. It works really fine. I had to use it uh, two, three times around uh, certain areas though to get off all that grime, especially around the knob areas. But it doesn't leave any residue and it's safe on this uh, metal plate. It won't erase any of the writing or anything like that. So the big capacitors are in. It looks like they'll fit, but of course the legs don't line up as you can see here in the picture. Uh, so I'll have to be creative and figure it out. I also want to offer a word of advice for anybody working with these capacitors. Um, they hold quite a charge, all right? So if you have an old unit lying around and then you go and plug it in, test it, and then you unplug and start working on it, it might not be enough, okay? So it's better if you can leave it unplugged for quite a few hours or even a day before you start working on it. Make sure that these are completely discharged because you can get quite a shock from something like that, all right? So please be careful. So here's what I figured out. I'm going to be using these two holes. The hole in the middle doesn't go anywhere, so I'll have to jump it. Um, I'm also going to glue down the capacitors since they don't have as much support anymore. So that's why I'm drawing a pencil mark around uh, and I'm going to be applying some glue. I apply just a bit of glue to the board and to the capacitor. And of course, making sure before I put it in that it's in the right direction. You don't want to put too much glue because you want to make sure that you're able to take it out in the future. Now on the underside, I fold the legs properly against the board and then I solder them in place. For the other holes that had extra leg for support, I just filled them with solder. I then install a jumper between the middle hole that I used that had no contact pad to the contact pad that it should connect to. I then test for continuity to make sure that everything connects up properly. And here's what the jumpers look like when finished. You can see I used the middle to the plus side and the middle to the negative side for the other. Now, even though the new capacitor is shorter, I managed putting the clip back on, the original clip, uh, and it's holding in place. And then of course I went through the whole board to check for um, bad solder joints. So here's the completed board with the modifications for the capacitors as well as uh, I redid all the solder joints whenever there was uh, any kind of a button or connector or switch there. And uh, I, of course, replaced it with all Nishikon capacitors, audio capacitors. 
There was one more board to clean up, so I redid all the soldering on that little board, tightened it up as well because it had gotten loose over the years. And then I redid all the soldering on the RCA connectors in the back. And last but not least, I used some contact cleaner for all the switches and knobs. And it's time to reassemble the unit. Fairly big job, 26 capacitors. Two of the large ones, 24 of the small ones. Um, cost wasn't too much of an issue. These uh, big ones were about $11 each, and the little ones were the average 75 cents, $2, dollar twenty five each. Um, I replaced it all with high-grade audio capacitors. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of that right now. I'll probably make a show one day just on capacitors. But I do want to mention something. Um, again, these were 44 years old. And um, you have to understand something. If you're going to plug it in and test it, you're always going to get false readings. I mean, these are 44 years old, and there's a lot of white papers from manufacturers out there that state that capacitors have about a 15-year lifespan. Now, these were 44 years old. Um, they will give you false readings. They will they will not perform correctly and i'll put it up on the screen by the way uh, i tested quite a few of these and it was failure after failure and after failure um, they had resistance they had high esr on them uh, and stuff like that so i just want to mention that and of course i did a lot of other work on the amp so uh, let's take a look at the finished product Well, there you have it. 
we just got through another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And last time I got some comments from everyone saying, yeah, but you didn't show us the unit working. So I didn't forget you this time. I filmed it and we are gonna listen to this beautiful amplifier from 1977. Let's take a look. 